Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Mechanical Engineering and Career Session with Professor Jeff Tensley from Griffiths University. In the session, you will learn about mechanical engineering and career opportunities in this field. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in throughout the session in Q&A chat box on your screen, and Jeff will respond to you. And now I would like to hand over to Jeff. Enjoy the session. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a bit of a talk about mechanics, and I don't know if uh, I had really thought about uh, the place of mechanics specifically in society and in our history. I read a little bit about uh, the school's curriculum, source society and mechanics and careers and a whole bunch of things in there. So I tried to fit some of that in here. So where does mechanics fit in society and then where does it fit within mechanical engineering and in engineering generally? Engineering is all about people. Um, a lot of students come into engineering thinking I'm never going to have to interact with people. All I have to do is focus on the technology. Well, I'm afraid the two necessarily have to go together. Um, it's all about creating a better world. Um, not only here, which we've already got a pretty good world in, uh, in Australia, but also overseas. And there's a, an interesting uh, photograph of, uh, I think it looks like he's in Nepal or India, um, uh, playing, learning how to use a 3D printer. So taking technology around the globe, enabling people to um, build careers and make uh, good livelihoods for themselves using the process of engineering. But engineering really is all around us. Um, I, I copied this graphic from my employment bureau in, uh, in Hong Kong, but you'll see in the cities, roads, railways, 4G towers, vehicles, bridges, intellectual, sorry, in, uh, um, um, what's the word, um, IT, uh, all, available to us on a regular basis. We see that in the countryside, irrigation, pipelines, communications, in our coasts, in the air. Um, there's nothing, sorry, there's very little that we see in our world that's not been engineered somehow, even if the engineering isn't all that visible. The fact that we might have a nice clean sky means that the engineers have taken out the pollution from the sky Something that, again, in developing parts of the world is a really hot topic and something to get uh, really excited about uh, being able to be involved in. Uh, but very few people know what engineering is. <clears throat> um, when I became a mechanical engineer, people assumed I fixed cars and then when I got my doctorate in mechanical engineering, people assumed I fixed really sick cars. Engineering, mechanical engineering is not really public facing. So you know what a lawyer does, you know what a bank teller does, um, all the different professions, but many people don't come across engineers on a day-to-day -day basis. And therefore I think there's a degree of ignorance about what engineering is. Let me tell you, I don't fix cars. Uh, I used to when I was uh, about your age and I had a lot of fun doing so, but that was a, a great experience, but that's not what I do for a living. What I do for a living is what I teach. I teach mechanics, I teach fluid mechanics, I teach design, um, and I spend a lot of time in a laboratory messing with blood and making artificial organs. I'm a long way from uh, being a mechanic. Not that being a mechanic is not a great thing to be doing, it's a lot of fun. So having said that, not many people really understand what uh, mechanical engineering is. I've got um, around the petals of this sunflower seed. Well, I guess mechanical engineering is supposed to be in the middle of the sunflower seed. I missed that out. You'll see that, uh, yes, there's a very heavy focus on machines, on analysis, on design, technology, Structures, electrical machines, you might be very surprised to hear. Management, fluid mechanics, materials, people in communication and manufacturing. They're the sort of themes that I could, could pull out of my head to think about what it is that mechanical engineers do. Um, 
I guess the word mechanical and the word machines are inevitably linked in people's heads. Uh, I thought I'd pull out electrical machines because most of the people generating electricity aren't electricians, they're mechanical engineers and they play with large turbines and great steam driven machines or um, uh, water driven machines um, in making electricity. And then in the list on the black background are the areas where you might find a mechanical engineering, a mechanical engineer practice. So, and this is an alphabetic order, aerospace. Um, just down the road from us, we have Gilmore Space that are making Mars habitats, which is pretty exciting. Automotive, of course, biomedical. I work personally with quite a few of the hospitals around here um, developing designs for sick people, devices for sick people, construction and building services. So all the structural engineering that goes on isn't necessarily with a civil engineer. Uh, mechanical engineers also do structures. Cross-sector technologies is a bit of a grab bag for um, all sorts of interactions that we might have between the different disciplines within the engineering profession. This is a list that came from Engineers Australia. And so these are the societies that they have within Engineer Australia. Manufacturing, of course, um, once we've designed things, analyzed them, we've got to manufacture them. Power and energy, a lot of uh, resources and interest now are going into renewable energies. Um, processes, people have to make jam, butter, coffee, water, um, oil, chemicals, a lot of mechanical engineers get involved in that. And then, of course, a very large outlet for engineers here in southeast Queensland, mechanical engineers, is in the railways. They're a big employer. Mechanical engineering, you might be surprised to hear, only started in 1847. So before that, well, most engineering was to do with military engineering. And then around the 1780s, the Society of Civil Engineers started. And so essentially there were then two sorts of engineering, military engineering and civil engineering. Um, George Stevenson, famous for making trains um, back in the UK, wanted to join the Civil Engineering Society and they didn't think he was qualified because he's a mechanical engineer, doesn't play with structures. So uh, he started the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in 1847. And since then, Institution of Engin uh, Civil Engineers and Electrical Engineers has all started up, have all started up. And so here are some interesting images of structures, civil engineering, um, war machines, military engineering, and then one of the first steam engines uh, in mechanical engineering. This is Notre Dame. Look at those flying buttresses. So um, the structures that peg to the ground, a bit like tent pegs, and link into the walls of the, uh, the church there, the cathedral there, what they do is they put pressure on the walls to help hold up the, the, the roof and the ceilings. The roof and the ceilings are extremely heavy uh, structures in these old cathedrals. And somebody somewhere got an idea about putting flying buttresses together and obviously built some scale models and played with it and tested it and they all seemed to work okay. But they wouldn't have had much analysis, analytical skills or tools um, to help them to know that what they were building was going to be any good. Here's another, um, uh, the first iron bridge in the world, built by a chap called Abraham Darby in 16, sorry, 1709 at Colebrookdale, at a place now called Ironbridge. Um, the, he was a, a smelter, an iron worker, and he wanted to get his products uh, to market more easily, and he had to get across. I think this is the Avon River. So he built a bridge. It's just a beautiful bridge. Um, to do that, he had to know about the materials. He was an iron smelter, so he knew about what uh, iron could do. Come up with a design. We don't usually put such nice, beautiful designs together these days in our functional structures. Build it and hope that it wasn't going to fail. Because again, they didn't have the sorts of 
analytical tools we have now that prevent us from or help us to avoid designing bridges that fall down. Here's a bridge collapse. There are plenty of bridge collapse stories around the world. Now, many of those bridges will have used the best design tools available at the time. But you know, until about the 1920s, people didn't really understand the effect of wind dynamics on the bridge. So as the wind blows across the bridge, the deck of the bridge starts to rock and get into some harmonics, some natural frequencies take over, and that can easily destroy the deck of the bridge. And this is what's happening here. They didn't have the science now of mechanics, which is what we use these days in putting together all sorts of mechanical devices, maybe static structures like this bridge, but equally uh, mechanics, which is the topic of this talk, we use um, also in moving devices. Here's another beautiful bridge. This is the Helix Bridge in Singapore. You can see this new uh, large area, the new large building. I can't think what they call it. It's a ship shape, but bends around the corner a bit over in Singapore. So what's changed between that bridge that fell down, the Iron Bridge, which is beautiful and still didn't fall down, um, and this Helix Bridge? Well, the materials, we know a lot more about materials these days. Um, mechanics is established as a science. For things like bridges, design codes are very important. So there are codes published by Australian standards or the standards institutions right around the world as to this is the grades of concrete you must use, the grades of steel, etc. that you must use to prevent us getting those designs wrong. But not all things in engineering are covered by those codes. Um, I design artificial hearts for a living. There's no codes that tell us how to design them. There are some codes that tell us how to test them. So those codes are established, but they are only in place for about 10% of what mechanical engineers do. And of course, now we have really good analytical processes. I don't know if you've seen finer element analysis. If you played with SOLIDWORKS at school, um, you're able to load up your designs that you've made and see how they deform and uh, buckle and where the stresses are. Let's think a little bit more about mechanics as an engineering science. So it's really broken into three main disciplines. Statics, where we look at um, the forces acting on a structure. Usually these are gonna be stationary structures. So maybe the truss work in a roof of a house or a factory. But we can also use the same um, understanding of statics to look at this is the our formula SAE race car that um, every year my, a team of um, engineers and other disciplines within the university um, build a race car. They start in January and they race it in Melbourne um, in December. So we can use the same sorts of static analyses to look at the frames, the twisting, the stiffness of a race car, a chassis. And you know, mechanical, engineer, mechanical engineers like to, think, like to keep things pretty straightforward. Right at the heart of mechanical engineering here is Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. If acceleration is equal to zero, um, the roof is not collapsing and falling, it's in static equilibrium, and we can use the sum of the forces plus the sum of the moments to analyze um, most simple structures. Um, we also then, once we know what the forces are within the structures, we can work out what materials we need to use, and then we can work out what size and shape of beams we need to resist the forces that are being applied to that structure. So we can also analyse things that are non-stationary and we call that dynamics. You will have seen, I'm told they're called the SUVAT equations here in, uh, in Australia. Um, distance is a function of time and velocity. Um, velocity is a function of acceleration and time 
and initial velocity. So you've probably seen those equations now, and they help us you, uh, to look at the motion of objects in essentially linear terms. So you might well have calculated, if I throw a ball um, and it starts with a certain velocity and a certain angle, how far will it travel before it hits the ground? Very useful equations we use in mechanics, not only at university level, but uh, all the way through the careers of engineers, these, um, these very simple equations. I'm afraid there are a whole bunch of other equations that we need to drop on top, but fundamentally at the core of all of this are the sorts of equations that you're seeing now in your year 11 and 12 syllabus. And of course, we look at rotational motion. So um, an object will carry on in a straight line and then less acted on by a force. Well, if there's a force, there has to be an acceleration. And so here you see acceleration is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius. And if I use that equation, force equals mass times acceleration, I get the equation there at the bottom that tells me how big the force on a string must be or how big the force on these tires for this car must be as this car goes around a corner. So Newton's second law fundamentally uh, defines what we do in statics and defines what we do in dynamics. We can also use uh, the conservation of things. So um, energy can be neither created nor destroyed. And so we can, here we've got an, uh, an equation for energy, which includes kinetic energy, gravitational energy, strain energy, thermal energy, chemical energy and nuclear energy. I must be able to track where all those energies go to. So if I use chemical energy to stretch a spring, the energy has not been dissipated, it's not destroyed, it's there somewhere in the spring, plus a little bit of energy that's given off as heat, the lowest form of energy that um, uh, floats around in the system. Equally, the Newton's cradle here, linear momentum also is conserved and we can say the same about angular momentum. We can just track these things are not getting lost in the system. Analysis, finite element work. So here's another bridge, it's not my work. I took this off, uh, off Google. And essentially we set up a little structure of grids and we, we apply the force is equal to the spring stiffness times the extension on every one of those little squares that make up this grid. And we can build up um, a very complicated uh, device like a bridge or a race car chassis and analyze using very simple mathematical terms wrapped around a computer. Um, we can analyze very complicated structures. But we started off by thinking about where engineering started, um, you know, in military engineering and civil engineering, then mechanical engineering. What's coming up in mechanical engineering? Um, again, a Google search got me to think about, well, Self-driving cars are certainly going to be part of our future. Hydrogen fuel cells. We, we, we heard about the hydrogen economy in the news over the last few nights. Um, it's a great way of being able to take wind and solar power and convert it into automotive transmission. Sustainable energy, of course. Nanotechnologies, windows that generate electricity. Um, Artificial intelligence, uh, again, that was on the news, looking at people's human rights. If everywhere you go, you can be recognized by the um, by the police force or the government. Additive manufacture, 3D printing of jet turbines, uh, medical devices, exoskeletons for military applications, also for, for people who are having trouble walking. We can use robots to um, wrap around their arms and legs and help them to move. Artificial hearts, this is the bivacore, the image on the right is the bivacore artificial heart. I'm a director of that company and uh, we're just about to put these into people. It's been ex extremely exciting. Aerospace again, SpaceX got launched uh, just last week, taking the first uh, Americans back into, into space, launched from an American platform. And obviously, a lot of environmental work, so nanofiltration, um, carbon capture and storage are where engineering is going, all very 
forward focused, always thinking about um, how we might make life on this planet a little easier. Last slide, I yesterday I looked at seek.com and typed in the term mechanical engineer just to see what sorts of jobs were available in engineering, in mechanical engineering. So there were 1,010 that said they were under the engineering category, 264 in mining, resource and energy, that's always a big sector. Um, manufacturing, transport, logistics, construction is down at the moment, but sometimes that's the biggest uh, category. Um, information and communication technology, I forgot to remember, it was about 60, I think it was. And then I also looked at biomedical engineering because I'm a biomedical engineer as well as mechanical engineer and down 111 jobs are posted currently in Australia. That was a bit of a whirlwind rush through mechanical engineering. That was the end of my talk. Um, I can see that were some questions came in. Um, are there job, are there other jobs or careers that utilize some of the lessons learned from taking a career on mechanical engineering? A hey, very interesting question. Um, one of the sectors I didn't put up on this list was banking. So I think there were about 30 jobs in banking because engineers develop the greatest analytical skills and um, investment banks, commercial banks really like to be able to, to uh, employ mechanical engineers or engineers generally because of those analytical skills that they develop as an engineer while they're studying as an engineer. Are there more questions? Can you tell us a little about biomedical, biomechanical engineering? Okay, look, um, there's a discipline called biomedical engineering that um, uses all of the all of the engineering disciplines within it. So you can be a biomedical engineer with a mechanical engineering focus. You can be a biomedical engineer with an electrical engineering focus. We even had a really exciting project in our school where one of our civil engineering professors was looking at bridges. But she was not looking at the bridges that carry cars across rivers, but dental bridges. And she was looking at um, how reconstructing dental bridges, um, how the materials survive the sorts of stresses and strains that uh, we see in chewing. So. I'm a biomechanical engineer, so typically what I will do is I'll use mechanics and also fluid mechanics in the design of medical devices. So the projects that I've got going at the moment are this total artificial heart, but also I'm really interested, if you put blood through a blood pump like a total artificial heart, the little red cells um, get smashed to pieces because of the extra stresses that they feel. And I'm trying to work out some computational model that will predict how badly the red cells will be destroyed by going through a blood pump. Another project I've got is essentially an industrial design project working along with, with some mechanical engineers and some orthopaedic surgeons looking at um, a little ligament in the wrist here. When you fall over this ligament pops and we're 3D printing that ligament. Um, and then seeding it with um, bone cells and ligament cells so that eventually <clears throat> the material with 3D printed is, is absorbed by the body, just leaving this nice new ligamental bridge of uh, natural, natural cells in place. Um, how does, so it's a little bit about biomedical engineering. How does mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering work together? Again, so I, I, you can get a degree in biomedical engineering. Um, that's the, there are universities, Flinders, QUT have degrees in biomedical engineering. Um, that wasn't the way that I went. I did a mechanical engineering degree and then I studied um, biomedical beyond that. Actually, it's part of my PhD and I studied anatomy and physiology and I did it that way because I thought it was safer if I'm a mechanical engineer, so if I'm a biomedical engineer and I apply for a job in um, biomedical engineering, fantastic. 
but you know we saw 110 biomed 111 biomedical engineering jobs and 2259 mechanical engineering jobs so the chance is finding a job in biomedical engineering is going to be a little bit more difficult than finding a job in mechanical engineering so I did a mechanical engineering degree with a biomedical engineering specialism that now gets me access to 220, 2,259 plus 111 jobs. And that's the way that we do our biomedical engineering program at Griffith. So it's a mechanical engineering degree or an electrical engineering degree with a biomedical engineering minor. So you'd still qualify to be a biomedical engineer, but you'd be able to apply for jobs in a much bigger pool for electrical engineering jobs or biomedical engineering jobs. Mechatronics, yeah, mechatronics is uh, a really exciting blend between mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. So um, you find a lot of robotics, for example, or self-driving cars are the domain of mechatronics engineering. Um, and essentially these are mechanical engineers with good understanding of electronics, or electronics engineers with good understanding of mechanics. Um, we weave, we weave mechatronics all the way through our mechanical engineering program. I personally teach a mechatronics course in second year where we have students to uh, build a robot that must deliver a certain payload under certain conditions. Um, we do have a mechatronics minor degree, so um, you can, do a bio, um, sorry, you can do a mechanical engineering degree with a mechatronics minor. You could do an electronics engineering, sorry, electrical engineering degree with a mechatronics minor. And so either way, you're using that discipline that you're most comfortable with, either mechanical or electrical electronics, and then you're dropping this mechatronics in on top. So yeah, there are two ways of being in that centre ground between mechanical and electrical, and I think you can get two mechatronics from either way. Um, are you able to mechatronics? How much do mechanics earn? I have no idea. So, um, I am an engineer. Typically, a graduating salary for an engineer would be about uh, sixty thousand um, dollars. Then as you move up the ranks towards senior engineer, you'd be probably looking at $200,000. Um, I don't know about mecha mechanics. So it probably depends on who they're employed by. It's like it's a normal um, trade position. If you go to seek.com.au and have a search, I'd have guessed about $60,000, $70,000. So about the starting salary of an engineer but then an engineer has a lot greater earning potential above that. Um, nanotechnology, yeah, that's a bit of a scary process. Um, nanotechnology is now creeping into, so do I have any information about nanotechnology is the question. Nanotechnology is creeping into everything. Um, so engineers are using, mechanical engineers are using nanotechnology in filtration, so taking very highly polluted water sources and filtering using nanotechnologies. We were able to use nanotechnologies in 3D printed structures to add enormous strength to those structures. Um, electronics engineers are using nanotechnology quite a lot. One of our, one of my colleagues at the Queensland Micro and Nano Fabrication Facility, which is on our Nathan campus, as looking at you know, the holograms, that uh, holographic displays that you see on um, Star Wars using, using nanotechnologies. Um, I'm also very interested in using nanotechnologies and sensing things like blood pressure and stresses within blood um, to be able to design better um, medical devices. So I know that engineering presents itself very much as mechanical, electrical, civil, electronic, environmental, but in so many ways it's one profession and all aspects of the profession are seen in all disciplines of the profession. So I've done a lot of electrical engineering, I've done a lot of ICT, I've done a lot of electronics, I've done a lot of materials engineering. So as an engineer, you will continue to learn for the whole of your life 
um, in all areas of engineering. So I wasn't a biomedical engineer when I started out. I'm now registered in Queensland as a biomedical engineer. And so you pick these things up as you go. The trick is find the discipline that is of most interest to you, that discipline which feels like the best fit, electrical, mechanical, civil, get a good grounding in engineering with those as, um, as the examples of your learning, and then, um, and then um, a branch out even further. The question about how much do mechanics earn is, has popped back up again. Again, I can't tell you. So a mechanic is, is um, a technician grade, um, and not a professional engineering grade. And so I really not looked at how much a mechanic earns. I would guess, as I said earlier, probably around sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, which is a, just a bit more than the starting grade for a graduate engineer. Um, and probably that stays a stable grade, hundred thousand dollars for the rest of your working career. Whereas um, as an engineer, you have a lot more chance to continue to grow and specialise and earn more money. OK, I think that has run us out of questions. So hopefully I've been able to answer all the questions that you've had. Hopefully you know a little bit more about engineering, mechanics and how they all fit into society. Um, thank you for your attention. Bye-bye, everybody.